Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you the Jewish Talmud Exposed. The Talmud is a central text of mainstream Judaism and consists primarily of discussions and commentary on Jewish history, law, customs, and culture. The word Talmud is a Hebrew word meaning learning and instruction. So some of the followers of Judaism use the Talmud for learning and instruction, just like Christians use the Bible for learning and instruction. Before we get into what the Talmud says, let's discuss what Judaism is for those of you that might not know. Followers of Judaism believe and follow the Old Testament, but they do not believe or trust in the New Testament. They believe that Jesus Christ was a real person, but they also believe that Jesus was a sinner, practiced sorcery, and was raised from the dead by the power of necromancy and not by the power of God. It's much more complex than that, so this is just a simple explanation only. Judaism is a religion. We all know that. But do you have to be a Jew to follow Judaism? And if you are a Jew, are you required to follow Judaism? No. Anybody can become a follower of Judaism. And just because you are Jewish doesn't automatically mean you follow Judaism. In fact, many people who call themselves Jews do not believe in Judaism at all. About half of all the Jews in Israel today call themselves secular and don't believe in God or any of the religious beliefs of Judaism. So this brings up the question, then who follows the Talmud? Not all followers of Judaism use the Talmud for instruction. It is more often used by Orthodox and Rabbinical Jews. So let me be clear, not all followers of Judaism use the Talmud. Only certain groups do. Besides using the Old Testament, Judaism has an oral tradition which explains what these scriptures mean and how to interpret them and apply the laws. The certain groups of people that do follow the Talmud believe God taught this oral tradition to Moses and to others down through the centuries. This tradition was maintained only in oral form until about the 2nd century AD, when the oral law was compiled and written down in a document called the Mishnah. Over the next few centuries, additional commentaries elaborating on the Mishnah were written down. These additional commentaries are known as the Gemara. The Gemara and the Mishnah together are known as the Talmud. This was completed in the 5th century AD. This is just a brief explanation of what Judaism is and who uses the Talmud for instruction. Okay, as we look at the verses in the Talmud, you will see the word Gentile used a lot. If you don't know what the word Gentile means, it simply means not Jewish. So here we go. Let's expose the Talmud for what it really is, evil. One who slaps the cheek of a Jew is considered as though he slapped the cheek of the Divine Presence. Is this trying to tell us that Jews are up on a pedestal and on the same level as the Divine Presence? So hitting a Jew is the same as hitting God? It sure looks that way. In a case when one found a lost item in a city where both Jews and Gentiles reside, if the city has a majority of Jews, he is obligated to proclaim his find. If there is a majority of Gentiles, he is not obligated to proclaim his find. So basically, lost items in a Jewish city must be turned into lost and found. And lost items in a Gentile city, it's a free-for-all and you can keep what you find. Oh, that's fair. It is permitted to financially benefit from a business error of a Gentile, i.e., it need not be returned. If a Gentile makes a business error regarding money, a Jew can take advantage of him and keep his money. With regard to bloodshed, if a Gentile murders another Gentile, or a Gentile murders a Jew, he is liable. If a Jew murders a Gentile, he is exempt. So, a Jew can kill a Gentile with no consequences. Whoa. What I don't understand is this. The writers of the Talmud believed in the Old Testament. So why are they disobeying the sixth commandment of, Thou shall not kill? Do Jews think they are above the law? 
one who withholds the wages of hired laborer. For a Gentile to do so to another Gentile, and for a Gentile to do so to a Jew is prohibited. But for a Jew to do so to a Gentile is permitted. A Jew can withhold wages from a Gentile, but a Gentile cannot withhold wages from a Jew. Not very fair, right? They decreed upon their daughters that they should be classified as menstruating women from the time they are in their cradle, i.e., they decreed that from when they are young, Gentile women are always considered to be menstruating. So Gentile women, from the time they are in their cradles, are considered as being in a state of constant menstruation. This is just weird. The Jewish people are called man, but Gentiles are not called man. Jews are men, Gentiles are not. The Talmud is so fair, isn't it? A person may not seclude himself with Gentiles because they are suspected of bloodshed. Hey, don't be alone with a Gentile because he might kill you. With regard to a woman, even though her protection accompanies her, i.e., she is not in danger of being killed, she may not seclude herself with Gentiles because they are suspected of engaging in forbidden sexual relations. Hey ladies, don't be alone with a Gentile because he might try to have sex with you or rape you. One may not keep an animal in the inns of Gentiles because they are suspected of bestiality. And a woman may not seclude herself with Gentiles because they are suspected of engaging in forbidden sexual relations. And any person may not seclude himself with Gentiles because they are suspected of bloodshed. This is just sick. Don't put your animals in a Gentile stable because he might try to have sex with your animal. And again, don't be alone with a Gentile for he might try to have sex with you or kill you. One may be treated by Gentiles provided that it is monetary treatment, but not personal treatment. And one may not have his hair cut by them anywhere, due to the danger that the Gentile will kill him with the razor. Well, isn't that nice? A Jew can't get a haircut by a Gentile because they don't trust them and think they will cut their throats. The property of a Gentile is like a desert, and anyone who takes possession of it has acquired it. A Gentile has no property rights, and you can take his land any time you want, according to the Talmud. If the Jew and Gentile were ascending an incline or descending a decline, the Jew should not be positioned below while the Gentile is above, so that the Gentile will not have the advantage of height if he decides to attack. Rather, the Jew should be located above while the Gentile is below and the Jew should not bend down before him, lest the Gentile break his skull. A Jew is supposed to always be standing higher than a Gentile, so the Gentile doesn't do a sneak attack and kill him. Wow. Is there any action for which a Jew is not deemed liable, but a Gentile is deemed liable for performing it? A Jew is not liable for engaging in anal intercourse with his wife. Uh... I have no comment for this one. With regard to an ox of a Jew that gored the ox of a Gentile, the owner of the belligerent ox is exempt from liability. But with regard to an ox of a Gentile that gored the ox of a Jew, regardless of whether the goring ox was innocuous or forewarned, the owner of the ox pays the full cost of the damage. This is a prime example of a Jew and his property being superior to a Gentile and his property. I guess all oxes weren't created equal. Apparently, it is permitted to deceive a Gentile. So apparently, the Talmud doesn't like Gentiles. In order to open the blisters to remove the pus, let his friend blow white cress into his mouth with a straw of wheat. And if he wishes to heal the blisters, let him bring dirt found in the shade of the bathroom and knead it with honey and eat it, as this is effective for curing the blisters. I'm sorry, but I'm not going to eat the dirt from any bathroom floor to try to cure any condition. This teaches that Adam had intercourse with each animal and beast 
in his search for his mate, and his mind was not at ease. So the Talmud teaches that Adam had sex with animals. I couldn't make this stuff up even if I tried. This next one is a shocker. I hope you are sitting down. A girl who is three years old and one day old, whose father arranged her betrothal, is betrothed with intercourse. As the legal status of intercourse with her is that of full-fledged intercourse. And in a case where the childless husband of a girl who is three years old and one day old dies, if his brother engages in intercourse with her, he acquires her as his wife. And if she is married, a man other than her husband is liable for engaging in intercourse with her due to the prohibition of intercourse with a married woman. This evil Talmud permits having full-fledged intercourse with three-year-old girls who have been married off by their fathers. Hey, but don't worry. If the husband dies, the brother can take over and marry the little girl and have sex with her. Anyone who follows and believes the Talmud should be ashamed of themselves. This reminds me of the Quran and Muslims having sex with young children. In fact, the Talmud and the Quran sound very similar in many of their evil teachings. And for all of you Talmud followers that don't believe what you just saw, here's another one that verifies that the Talmud allows sex with little girls. With regard to an adult man who engaged in intercourse with a minor girl less than three years old, or a minor boy less than nine years old who engaged in intercourse with an adult woman, or a woman who had her hymen ruptured by wood or any other foreign object, the marriage contract for each of these women is 200 dinars. So, if an adult man has sex with a three-year-old and even younger than that, all they have to do is pay 200 dinars for a marriage contract. Was the Talmud written by Satan himself? And let's finish up with some quotes the Talmud has about Jesus Christ. Whereas Jesus the Nazarene who was a Jewish sinner. So Jesus was a sinner. Jesus performed sorcery, incited Jews to engage in idolatry, and led Israel astray. The Talmud is telling us that Jesus performed sorcery, promoted idolatry, and led Israel astray. Onkelos then went and raised Jesus the Nazarene from the grave through necromancy. Onkelos is mentioned several times in the Talmud. According to the traditional Jewish sources, he was a prominent Roman nobleman, a nephew of the Roman Emperor Titus. This tells us that they thought a normal man raised Jesus from the dead using magic and that God did not raise him from the dead using a supernatural miracle. So, the Talmud says that Jesus was a sinner who performed sorcery and was raised using necromancy. You know, I'm not surprised by this, because that is exactly what Satan wants us to think about Jesus. And let's finish up with one more about Jesus. On Passover Eve, they hung the corpse of Jesus the Nazarene after they killed him by way of stoning. The Talmud messed up and made a really big mistake with just this one sentence. First, it proves that the writers of the Talmud which was between the 2nd and 5th centuries AD, knew that Jesus was a real person who died. This validates what the New Testament of the Bible says. Second, this sentence proves the timing of Jesus' death, Passover. This also validates what the New Testament of the Bible says. So I guess we can thank the Talmud for messing up and making this mistake to validate the life of Jesus Christ. So ladies and gentlemen, now you know a little bit about the evil teachings of the Talmud and why I felt I needed to expose it. If the followers of Judaism would stick with the Old Testament only, and my greatest hope is that one day they would realize that Jesus Christ is the Messiah and would come to accept the New Testament as well, then the Talmud would be deemed unnecessary, and much of the conflict between Talmud-believing people and Christians would be over. One thing I will never understand is this. Why can't the Bible be enough for people? Why do they feel they need other sources? 
Do they feel that God didn't give us enough answers in the Bible? Do they feel that the Bible is not sufficient? All these religions that use other books like these have been deceived. I don't think these people realize that one of Satan's greatest tricks is to mix truth with lies. Let's say, for example, that all of these books are mixed with 60% truth and 40% lies. It's this 40% that can lead people astray and possibly lead them to hell. And it's this 40% of lies that causes so much conflict within Christianity. These books are not necessary. If people would stick with the Bible only, as God intended, then Christianity wouldn't have so much conflict between the different denominations. And more importantly, non-Christians wouldn't be looking at us like we were crazy and confused. I will keep saying this over and over until I am blue in the face. Follow Jesus Christ only, and also follow the Bible only. Thank you very much for watching this video. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel and please share this video with your friends and family to help spread the truth of Jesus Christ. God bless and I will see you next time. Does Judaism, as it is practiced today, have anything to do with the patriarchs and prophets of the Old Testament? Nothing. Nothing at all. You see, I was raised in Judaism, and we were under the authority of the rabbis whose formulation of God and the world around us was based not on the Bible, but on the Jewish Talmud. Indeed, the, the rabbinic authority gave the first and final word on Jewish attitudes, Jewish belief, Jewish practice, and Jewish behavior toward the Gentiles, whom behind closed doors we called the Goyim. The rabbis put attitude before everything else, that we Jews were superior to the Gentiles in intellect, in morality, and as a race. And this is all spelled out quite specifically in the Jewish Talmud. The Talmud began as an oral law prevalent at the time of Christ. And it was Jesus Christ himself who accused the Jewish leaders of his day of usurping the message of the patriarchs and prophets of the Old Testament by this oral law, which Christ labeled the tradition of the elders. Enraged by Christ's censure, the Jewish elders arranged for Jesus Christ to be crucified and ignoring the significance of his resurrection committed their tradition to writing, which reached its final form in 800 A.D. in the multi-volume set known as the Talmud. The Talmud, first and foremost, blasphemes the Lord Jesus Christ, calling him a magician who is now in hell, boiling in his own excrement. The Talmud also blasphemes Christ's Holy Mother, the Virgin Mary, calling her a hairdresser, a prostitute, who had sex with carpenters. Then the Talmud spews its venom on the Gentiles to be treated less than subhumans, defrauded, cheated, and even murdered as civilians in times of war, though they be innocent women and children. Thus we find world Jewry condoning the atrocities committed against the people of the Gaza Strip by the Israelis. Why? Because, as historian Israel Shehak points out in his book, Jewish Religion, Jewish History, Jewry's disparaging attitude toward the Gentiles has been formed, set in stone, throughout the centuries by the writings of the Jewish Talmud. Indeed, the Talmud, formative of Judaism since the time of Christ, is nothing less than a religion 
of a tribal crime syndicate. The true followers of the patriarchs and prophets of the Old Testament are those who have embraced the hopes and predictions of those holy men realized and fulfilled in the New Testament. As a former Jew, now an Orthodox Christian, I'm a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. What about you?